Uh, today, we're going to have a look at the kicks in Kihon. The Kihon, as you know, Kihon just means basics. And literally, I always describe Kihon as everything you're doing in training other than the actual event. So although we know Kihon as the 30 basic Kihon techniques that we do, in actual fact, all the footwork drills, all the movement drills, everything you're doing that is not the live event against a non-compliant opponent is a form of kihon. Is that a fair call? Yeah. I'm, I'm I learned guess... it from you, so I agree. <laughs> I, I guess it's the same in your industry too, is that in that, you know. Um... All training's non-specific, essentially, yeah. apart from the actual event that you're going to compete in. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's, ex I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> so we're going to have a look at the kihon techniques. Now, remember, it's always good to keep in mind that the human body being the shape it is, as it is, round. So it means all kihon conform to that. Kicks to the front, kicks to the sides. You have the center line, you have the side center line, and you have some kicks that come in at an angle. So you have uh, body mawashis, body, uh, two, two soku body mawashis, uh, things like that. You have ushiro mawashi giri, and even the, the mawashi giri to the, to the neck and the face comes in at a slight angle like that. So keep that in mind when we do things. One way I like to describe it is that certain kicks you kick out the front pocket and certain kicks you kick out the back pocket. And a lot of people get those two confused. For example, they try to do a side kick out the front pocket, whereas the side kick should be out the back pocket. Okay, so can you just take us through some stretches that you think would be um, just what would you do if you say had a five or ten minute opportunity to do a little bit of stretching before yep, kicks? Sure. Yep. Yeah. So, I, I, I do what I do for me. Yes. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be for everyone. Of course. But I would do what I do for me. So these are interesting because we have the tr traditional, as Mitch stretches, I'll um, talk a little bit. We have the traditional Kyokushin warm up, but Mitch also emphasizes some things which we like to look at. For example, what is this good for? A hip flexor stretch. The hip flexors are the muscles in front of the hips which lift your legs up. Very important, but we tend to neglect them somewhat. Yeah, absolutely. In, yeah. Absolutely. In the meantime, good to see everyone. Daniel, Bus, Shiham Mac, Paul, good to see you. It's good morning for you. It's good afternoon for us. Good to see everybody. So the hip flexors are the, the muscles in front of the body that flex the hip that bring the knee up okay and we use them in pretty well every kick i can't think of a kick off the top of my head would be the only one that yeah you're not really using it but sometimes you you kind of would depending on the way you're through that kick as well yep. um probably shouldn't use it as much as some people do but uh you know the hip flexors in many respects are the limiting factor aren't they if well ian calls them the key to lower body health. So health in the lower body, they, they because of their anatomy, uh, their origin insertion where they sit, they provide, they have an incredible role in how the pelvis, how the hip sits essentially in relation to the spine, which is a real key um, in the health of the lower body. So yeah, a very important muscle group, along with everything else. But just as a, if we're speaking in generalities, uh, they're very important. So see, all these stretches are focused on these muscles here, the muscles that are used to bring the knee up. That's the hip flexors. And if there's one series of stretches that you can add to your general training, which you may not do enough of, it's these hip flexor stretches. They're really, really important. Absolutely. And, uh, we do them in Kyogashin, but we don't do them enough. I'd say the... Yeah, well, I'll do it now if you want. The, the, yes. So from here, we'll do the... We do the... Type of thing. Yes. And then we'll go each in this position. The three-count exercise. That's a hip flexor stretch, if you like, when you do it properly. But when we do it in Kyokushin, we don't place enough emphasis on the hip flexors. And it's probably something which... It's a great stretch, that one. Yeah, it's a really nice stretch. So the three-count exercise that we do there like that. Are you attempting to raise the bent hip? Do you mean bring the foot up behind, Mac? 
because you can do that too. Yeah, I was doing that just before. Yes. So here, yeah, yes. yeah, absolutely. So one of the mistakes people make in hip flexor stretching is this is a single joint stretch. Um, is that Chia Mac from yes. the UK? Yep. So this is a single joint stretch here. And so it's only looking at the hip flexor, but most movements are compound movements and two joint movements. So when we do this, now we're stretching the hip and we're, we're stretching the hip the hip flexor from the hip end, but also from the knee end as well. And we can go forward. So that's the second part of it. It's very, very important. So, so sorry, going back to- Yeah, 100%. So you stretching. can add that into the three counts. Yeah, so so look, we go one, two, and in the second part, you pause, take your time, work the hip flexor, elevate the foot to get the top, the origin and insertion. But you don't want to do it at the expense of a hip position. So look, this is easier. Going here is more difficult. So we're trying to go here and here, essentially, with a trunk vertical. You've got to individualize it to your level, some. What's the difference between ball of the back foot on the ground compared to the instep? This and this. Probably angle of the knee. And yeah, the angle it. of the knee. This will be less of a stretch, more hip flexor. This will bring the quad into it just a little bit. But we're talking... My news, yeah. yeah. And this will obviously, as another level, is bringing the quad into it a lot more. You can also do this. Yeah, this is beautiful. If you're, you want to sit in front of the sofa, all right, if you put in the chair, it'll slowly push the chair back. But if you sit in front of a sofa and put your leg up on the sofa like that, that'll allow you to relax more and allow the muscle to uh, stretch yeah, more comfortably. Go forward, all different variations. Yeah. And then so. So I have a habit, I'll generally stretch a lot before training. When I say a lot, I don't mean a variety of stretches necessarily, I mean time-wise. Um, so why is that? Why, why do some athletic development, I mean, people say that you shouldn't stretch before training? <laughs> no, no, it's Freudian. Freudian slip. Well, there's a, there's a lot of research out there allegedly that shows if you stretch before training, it makes you weaker. You're not as strong, it dissipates power and so on. So there's a real fear around that. There's a real Americanization around training these days that bigger and stronger is better, which we just know is not true. There's that saying, you know, all things being equal, the bigger and stronger person will do better. And that's true, but all things being equal, the faster person will do better. All things being equal, the fitter person will do better. All things being equal, the more flexible person will do better. All things being equal, the more prepared person. All things being equal, the more technically skilled. All things being equal, the more tenacious person. So it's not something that I get into too much. There's a lot of, that's the reason behind it, the sort of that kind of research, which is very short term. But if you look at an athlete's body or someone's body over a long term, not just a 4, 12 or 16 week study, but over 4, 12, 16, 20 years, you'll see that training, any types of training will put stresses on connective tissues. It'll generally shorten and tighten connective tissues. And the aging process does the same thing as well. As we get older, our connective tissues become shorter, tighter, and more dehydrated, generally speaking. So we want to do things to minimize that. And one of the things that we can do is we can stretch before training. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first one is I want to give my body joints or my body's joints the range they need in the activity I'm about to do. Why would I do that after when it's finished? Why wouldn't I do it before? The second point is, whatever gets done first in training gets prioritized. So after training, I've got no issues with people stretching after training. I think it's fantastic, I really do. But the energy you put into it and the focus you get and the adaptation your body gets is less than if you do it before. And if I was to look at people and look at their strength, their speed, their flexibility, their endurance, and rate them on a scale of one to 10, I guarantee you most people's flexibility would be low on their, look at Xiaom, that's a great groin range. Um, I guarantee most people's flexibility would be lower compared to the other physical qualities. So therefore we, we prioritize that to ensure that long-term, not just for this training session, but long-term for the athlete's body, they're prioritizing flexibility at certain points in their training. And that doesn't stop us from doing some static stretching before training, like we've just been doing, and then doing some more dynamic stretching and then ballistic stretching, which a lot of the Kelkashin Kihon is actually doing in a really specific way. So we're getting we're getting all the different types of stretching done, not just 
one type of stretching, if that makes sense. Um, and there's a couple of really good exercises which give you mobility on the mat. So one, is the, one of the things that you find as you get older is your ability, your ability to be mobile on the mat. But so there's some good exercises you can do to help you get mobility and flexibility through the hips. And this is a really good exercise too. You come in and push forward, see like that? And then step back and switch feet, push forward. See, I've had trouble with my knee here. Come back, sit, switch feet, come back, push forward. This sort of thing. Push your hips forward there. From the side, it looks like this. Back, project my hip forward. Back, project my hip forward. That sort of movement is very good to develop that hip mobility on the mat when you need it. This sort of thing here. You find doing these sort of things when you grapple, they become very important. The importance of being able to come up here and push off like that. And just going back to something I was saying before, in terms of how much, I'll, I'll, uh, Ian King Summer, he recommends minimum 20 to 40 minutes of stretching before training. Um, I agree, I actually do more myself. And it depends on time. Shian said, if you've got five or 10 minutes, what would you do? I'd do something like that. Of course, the floor is important too, on a hard wooden floor. It can be a challenge to do hip flexor stretching on it, I agree. But you can do things like, as long as it's okay in the dojo, you can get a shoe, for example, put it under the knee. Um, and that way it pads the knee a little bit. So there's always solutions to these things if we think a little bit laterally. So we're going to look at some Kihon now. So let's think about Kihon in terms of fine detail. So we get right back so you can see our whole body. So what we have here is, generally speaking, a lot of people practice Kihon from a wider stance. I disagree with that. Why? Because then you have two axes. So if I if I want to kick with my left leg and I'm in yoi, what happens is I have to move my weight from this leg to allow the kick. Okay? And vice versa. So what I need to do is, for the sake of practice, bring the feet essentially together. It doesn't have to be particular, but essentially together so that when you kick, you elevate the leg, you don't have to change the axis from one axis. You don't actually have two at one axis, you have two axes, the spine and then most fighting is based on left leg and right leg. Okay, so what you're going to see there is the change of axis as you go. So for the sake of basics, we bring our feet together. Okay. Kicks to the center line, we like to put our hands, you're not just flopping, you do put your thumbs in, but you don't hang. You, you control your fists there, like so, with good posture. Okay, so here's a getting. Knee kick, itch, knee, sun, chi. Okay, so there's one really important detail is when you return to the, the foot to the floor, see if I can make noise, try and stop it down, itch. See? Hear that noise? You want to do it so that there is no noise. Itch. Deep. Tom. She. Okay, the reason you do that is because if I can put my foot down without making noise, it means I'm putting it down control. So if I have to, I can move out of the way and continue on. Okay, if I flop my foot down, I have no control. If I finesse my foot down, it means I have control over what's going on. So here's a getting knee kick, itch, knee, sun, shep, kiari tip. We won't, we won't kiai just for the sake of it. We'll do them a little bit quicker. We'll just do 10. Itch, knee, sun, shep, go, go, hit, up, kip, do. So when you kick, the foot faces the ground like that. When I kick, the foot the toes face down. Good. King Getty, King Getty, the groin kick, or it's often called Kyushu Getty or kick to the groin, um, which remember in all kicks, the side of the gun is your knee. So wherever your knee points, that's where your kick will go. There, there. If I want my kick to go high, I lift my knee high. So, 
and kick. But it's not true. I put my knee high when I try to kick, it still goes low. <laughs> That's just me. Okay, but you get the idea. If I want to kick high, I need to make sure that my knee is pointing high so that when it comes high, it can still go there. If I want to kick to the body, I point the knee to the body so that that's where the kick goes. Use that to descent to your deceptive advantage too. I kick head, head, I fake to the head and go low to the body as well. That's a possibility as well. Okay, so you can use that idea of my knee being a sight. Uh, Midori Kenji used to do that better than anyone in the world, I think anyway. He'd come up, fake, and then drop it into the body like that. Okay, so you can use that knee sight as a deceptive tool as well. Okay, so groin kick, I'd like to pull my pants up a little bit. We point, extend, and back. Point, extend, back. Itch, knee, sun, chi. Good. Uh, fast now, kiai. We say kiai it there, or with kiai, but we won't do kiai because we don't want to scare all the neighbors away. Ready. Itch, knee, sun, chi, go, go, itch, touch, ku. Okay, so it's all about the snap in that one. Maya Getty, we use the chew socket. So we kick the ball of the foot in the ground so you get a proprioceptive feedback so you know which part of the foot you're kicking with. So I'll get this to hold my hand just so you can see. When I put, put the foot up, I, I used to do this. This is worth watching. When I was a little boy, you know, the, the, the difference between the instep the ball of the foot, the soccer toe, the kaka toe, all these things, they were difficult for me. I couldn't go from one to the other very easily. So I literally used to lie in bed at night time and I just let do this. Kick up in step, pull it back, ball of the foot, pull it back, in step, pull it back, ball of the foot, pull it back, side kick, pull it back, roundhouse kick side kick, groin kick, front kick. And you can see because my body's not moving, the ankle is actually flexing, extending, flexing, extending like that. And you've got to train your body to be able to do that naturally. And actually I found just by doing that for just a few nights when I was a little kid, uh, it gave me the ability to coordinate that so if you have trouble doing that, that's a really good way to do it. Just lie in bed and just work those different positions. In step, ball of the foot, side kick, and kakakwa, okay, for the back kick. Okay, so let's look at mayagiri now, which is uh, pushing the, the uh, in step in. Pitch, knee, sun, chi. Now I will say one other thing. If you work on jigsaw mats, you have to consider the negative impact on your ankle, knee, and hip. And I, I know no one's ever done a paper on it, but it's just a matter of time. In fact, speaking to Frederick in uh, Sweden, he was saying that he did mention that to a couple of physiotherapists. It's a possibility they do some research on it. But I think if you look at the increase in ankle, knee, and hip injuries in martial arts since people started to work stand up on jigsaw mats, I'm fairly certain you'll see a huge impact because what happens is it's very natural when I throw a front kick, for example, if I'm on a surface like a wooden floor or even this carpet, the foot slips very naturally. You watch when I throw, I extend my foot, that foot will support leg will change angles. In a jigsaw mat, it won't do it. It digs down into the jigsaw mat, it's too spongy. When you throw the kick, the body wants to turn, but the leg wants to stay there, so it means the knee is doing this sort of thing. And over time, repetition, 10,000, 100,000 kicks, before you know it, you've got knee problems. Okay, so keep that in mind. So as a result, when we do kihon on jigsaw mats, we hyper-exaggerate the foot turnout because you're kicking out of that front pocket. So it means you have to go like that. In a jigsaw mat, if your foot is too straight, do that, it's going to wreck the, yeah. 
the, the knees are hinge joint, as we know, it goes forward and back. It doesn't like twisting. No, definitely. So if you work jigsaw mats, it doesn't hurt. I say to the guys, feet turn out. And that's why when we do the stomp turn drill, when we're working the kick, if I want to kick Mitch, say I want to kick Mitch, I go stomp, I stomp the kicking leg. Stomp, turn. And the reason I hyper uh, exaggerate the foot turn is when you work on jigsaw mats, you're going to hurt yourself. If I go step and I go to try to do a kick there, my leg doesn't turn, literally you're destroying your knee with every kick. So what we'll do is go stomp, turn, turn that kick and bring the leg up like that uh, to make sure that the knee is protected. Stomp, turn, there like that, okay? So it's really important that you protect your knees over time. So if you're on jigsaw mats doing the front kick, I like to turn them out like uh, Musui does. Otherwise, if you're on a surface that slips nicely, you can go back to doing the ace of the match. Okay, my good hits. Me. Some. She. And quickly, it's. Me. Some. Me. Go. Go. Pitch. Hutch. Two. Two. Of course, Dave. Dave's had some great success in uh, Norway with his kids. Really, why do you think that there are so many hip replacements in my... <laughs> Good question. Why are there so many hip replacements and knee replacements in, in martial arts? Uh, for a lot of the reasons we just talked about. Yes. Because the stuff that people don't want to do, the flexibility and dropping t tension in the body, it comes back and catches up with this. Tra all, all training is a result of... It's all compounding, like compound interest was at the eighth or ninth wonder of the world. Same thing happens in our bodies. Every time we apply stimulus to our connective tissues, there's a compounding effect. You let that go long enough and don't address it, what's going to happen? The bones are going to move closer and closer together. In terms of the hip, this bone, the femur, moves into the acetabulum, the socket, the ball and socket of the hip. You do a lot of this high kicking and all this type of stuff and don't drop the tension. The head of the femur jams into the acetabulum, doesn't get happy, and you need to shave the top of the hip or get a hip replacement. Um, but you need to do the other work to minimise the likelihood of that. It's no guarantee, and obviously genetic factors come into play and so on, so I'm not saying it's 100% certain, but I'm sure the ratio of them could drop significantly if this other work was done. I think it's actually a combination of that because, well, there's look, every individual is completely different. You can have two people do exactly the same thing year after year, and one person will have hip replacements, the other person will go all the way through without a problem. So it has a lot more to do with that as well. The genetics plays a lot. The other thing too is exactly when I say stretching, I talk about grabbing a stretch. So when I say grab a stretch, it's an acronym for gaze. So your gaze has to be in the right place at the right time for the right stretch. Otherwise, you start to miss a line. So it's a gaze, G. R is relaxation. A is alignment. And you have to make sure that your alignment is correct. So you can do lots and lots of stretching, but if your alignment is off, you're actually going to be damaging yourself over time. Okay, and B, of course, is breathing. You coordinate the, uh, good, you coordinate the um, uh, stretch with the breath as well. I'll just say, if, if you don't mind one more thing yep. quickly, is it, the, the other thing is, if, if you're thinking of martial arts, a lot of the training for hip is, is this type of stuff. It's what we call quad dominant activity. It's shortening and tightening the hip flexor. It's pulling the head of the femur forward in the hip socket. And if you're doing strength training that emphasizes the quads a lot as well, you'll do the same thing. That pulls the femur head uh, forward in the acetabulum. So you're, the, the outside training you do, the, the cross training, whatever you want to call it, we call it non-specific training or dry land training, it has to balance that off too. So doing things for the posterior chain, deadlift, power clean, snatches and so on, can sometimes also help, in addition to the stretching and tissue work, reverse the damage that the training itself is doing to the joints. Yes. Could people be teaching karate too early before they're really qualified to do so? Oh, Unfortunately, yeah. Mike, I think there are people who have been teaching karate for 50, 60 years who are still not qualified to do so. Because it's a simple thing that if you're teaching the wrong thing over and over and over, you're not going to get the right answers. And I think there's probably, yeah, I think you're spot on, there's a big opportunity or a big need for people to understand more clearly what they're doing. Yes. Because... Uh, it's very destructive if you're telling people to do something that is incorrect. You're, over time, they're going to keep doing it. They have faith in you, and the next thing you know, they're doing the wrong thing. Okay, so I also think there are certain uh, ways of doing the kicks which 
could be dangerous. For example, when you're Uchimashi, Sotomashi Giri, if you're doing the Uchimashi Giri, Sotomashi, if you're doing them incorrectly, I'm, I swear you're putting a lot of stress on the hip joint. There's no doubt about it. So now we go Kansetsu Giri. So we're just going to turn 45. In the dojo, we tend to turn 45 so that we can do the side kicks and it gives us more room. Okay, so Kansetsu Giri, kicking into the knee, is with the Sokoto. Sokoto is the side of the, the uh, heel. Okay, not just the side of the foot, but it's like a knife. You take a big kitchen knife, very heavy heel, and it gets thin down the end. And when you're chopping mushrooms, you can chop with the end of the, the light end of the blade. But if you're chopping carrots or pumpkin, definitely you'll be up here with the heavy end. Well, it's the same. If you wanna if you wanna do it like a snap kick or a snap side, they used to call the they used to call like this little body marsh you're getting with the toes. They used to call that a, a yoko getting, okay? For us, a yoko getting is out the back pocket. Okay, so I'm here, out the back pocket, and kick with the side of the heel. Whereas, I can do out the front pocket, maashi getting, and it, uh, sokoto, uh, it's yoko getting, and it can come up in like that. So it's a snap kick with the front part of the sokoto, okay? Because it's a speed technique. And for a speed technique, as long as your foot is conditioned and your leg is structurally sound, you'll generate the same power. They're like that. For a power side kick, you're kicking out the back pocket. That's a really important um, distinction. Front pocket, front kick, front pocket, roundhouse kick, front pocket, front side kick, like it looks like a roundhouse kick. Okay, so there, that's really important. For side kick, just for the sake of the basics, you want to make sure that the kick comes out the back pocket, okay? So the knee comes up. I like even to bring the knee to the opposite shoulder so you get that build-up of tension and, and you kick out the side, yes, like that, okay? Side kick. So when you're doing it left and right, once again, I kind of turn my feet a little bit so that it's already aiming out the back pocket. Okay, so we go right leg, pitch. Left knee, some, she, go, go. See, like that. So you're kicking out the back pocket. Just come forward back towards me here. Okay? And of course, if you've got the flexibility, you kick much higher. Um, I normally kick this high, but I don't want to embarrass Mitch. I saw you do it this morning. Yes. Okay. So, I think that's at 50. <laughs> so yeah, if you can look, if you can get them high, great. So also used to say, always try to kick higher when you're doing the basics. Okay, but if you compromise your technique to do it, like I could probably kick high, but to do it, it would compromise my correct body position. So what you do is you take it to the height that you're comfortable with, which for me is probably around midsection height. So we're here for the sake of basics. We might put our hands in the front of our belt, and that helps us to relax the shoulders. Remember, so I said 90% of all problems are connected to excessive tension in the shoulders. So especially when you kick, the tension comes up, okay? So to help prevent that, you relax the shoulders and just hang your, hand, your arms in your belt, okay? And from there, you can pull it down. So we go uh, right, then left. Itch, knee, sun, chi, go, go, pitch, hutch, Good. Good. Okay. Kansetsu Giri is essentially the same thing, except you're driving it down into the knee. But in reality, you can, you really drive it down. And you might remember in the old days, we used to do that, right? When we do basics, instead of just standing there and going, Kansetsu Giri, what we used to do is we'd step forward. One, two, then kick down, step back. One, two, step back, like that. One, two. That's a good way to do it too. It'll teach, teach your students to be more mobile with the concepts of Gary. One, slip, slip forward, and like that, and you'll get a nice power kick, particularly, let's say, for example, in a multiple attack, and then, then someone there, someone there, someone there. I can slip forward to this guy, then bang, crack down on this guy's knee, and it'll make a really 
uh, a strong buildup of, of energy. Okay, so we go to Hans and Yeti. I've got to be careful here. Jit, Ni, Sun, Chi. Good. Okay, it's Ni, Sun, out the back pocket. Chi, Go, Go, Pitch, Touch, Ku, Ju. Let's look at one detail here. Watch my shoulder. I bring my knee up. As I kick, I don't want to go here. I don't want to bring this back shoulder. To the kick back shoulder to the kick but i don't want to do that what i want to do is take the shoulder away so as i kick the back shoulder comes back like that the shoulder pulls back so you get that nice line of power through the kick okay so that's really important it's very valuable too okay ushiro geti ushiro geti once again it's really important that you understand to try to keep the ball, the kick within the line of the body. The further the kick comes to the side, the more visible. If I'm here with Mitch and I want to throw a kick, and that kick comes in a big circle around, it's very easy to, to see. Okay, on the other hand, if I come in and keep it so my knees rub together, it's much harder for Mitch or to be able to see it. I'm not saying can't block it, I'm just saying it makes, makes it fractionally harder. Okay, so when you do the back kick, one of the things that you can really work on is the idea of not allowing the knees to come apart too much. I don't want to go here like that. I want to try to bring my knees together. See that? The knees kind of straight. Because the, the more I come, I'm going to lean on this, the more I come out, the more my foot turns over. But I want the foot so that the heel is up and the toes are down. So the way I do that is kick straight back, okay? So, bitch, me, son, she. Another thing I like to do is counterbalance. If I swing my whole, if I throw the right kick and throw my whole right body into it, Nothing wrong with it, if it knocks him out, that's also I said, if it knocks him out, that's the right way to do it. But if I turn my whole body around, it's hard to come back again. And remember, you have default position. Everything you do starts and finishes in default position. So I want to make sure that when I do the kick, I can counterbalance the forces that have been thrown. So if you watch my right shoulder and arm, when I throw the right kick, I counterbalance like that. So that way that allows me. Watch what happens if I throw a, a similar kick, but I keep my arms and shoulder uninvolved. See, it, it, it pulls my body weight. And you don't want to you don't want to do anything like that in a in a fight because if you're in out of control for a split second, that can be enough. So I don't want to have my arm and body not involved. So to stop that, I counter balance the kicking motion with a large. So you see now, when I throw the kick, it doesn't throw my balance off by popping my right shoulder forward slightly. Okay, right and left. Bitch. Me. Sun. She. Good. And uh, 10 more. Bitch. Me. Sun. She. Go. Oh, pitch, punch, kill, do, and my washi giddy. Okay, so my washi giddy in the old days when I was young and nimble, we'd do 20 thigh, 20 to the body, and then 20 to the head. These days, I'm lucky if I get 20 out at all, of course, never. So, for the washi giddy, there's a couple of ways to look at it. One is, like I said, the idea of keeping the leg inside the line of the body. So as I throw the kick, I want it to be deceptive. I kind of throw it at that angle. So I throw the front kick, and it stays in line in the side, inside the line of my body. I can also throw a roundhouse kick, if you can imagine, my knee, the line of my knee, keeps coming up in the same direction, but 
at some stage I turn my foot over and bring it around. So the knee stays in the same line and the foot comes around like that. Around, so the knee itself stays in the line of the body. The foot comes around the circle and that can be quite deceptive. The other way to develop, which requires a much better control of the hip flexors and gets a little more power, I would say, is bringing it around from behind like this. So we used to actually practice kicking yourself in the butt first, like that. Kick yourself in the butt first and around. Kick yourself in the butt like that. Okay, so that's a really good way to practice as well. It's really good. You hold your partner's hand and you work on bringing the leg back. So we go one, right leg back. One, no, no, well, use your right leg. One, like that. And you work on the idea of bringing the leg back behind you. There. And then you turn your foot to face each other. Then you bring it back and kick it. Around and kick it. Around and kick it. And then what happens is in this situation, I can split here and I can kind of bend it and bring my leg like that. See that? And then you get more power as the kick comes through uh, with the body weight behind it. It's a lot better. Okay, so that's a roundhouse kick. Let's do a few. Pitch. Knee. Son. You notice my foot. When I put it down, I'm already turning. Cheek. Turn. Go. Look. Pitch. Touch. Cue. Do. Bang. And. Thanks, Mitch. So that's an idea of some of the key points that are very important in the Kihon techniques for the kicks. The alignment is very important. Kicking out the front pocket for the front kicks, out the back pocket for the side kick and uh, the back kick. Okay, that's really important. When we do the back kick in a more dynamic way in the dojo, can we do it from a fighting sense? Rather than just here, Okay. When we do it in a dynamic fighting stance situation, this is the way that was taught to me by Benny the Jet Burkini, actually, and I love it. From here. I come here and swing. And look, my weight is on the kicking leg. It makes sense. Most people think, how does that work? Because my weight is on the support leg. But if you want to get power in a kick, let the weight go into the kicking leg. So that's why when we teach guys how to kick, for example, if Mitch holds his hand up, what I try to do as a drill is I throw the kick and then headbutt the target. Not that I'm going to do that in a fight, but what that does is it teaches your body to stay in the technique. That gets my body weight forward. Like that. See that? One. If I let my head fall away, there's no power on the kick. There's no body weight. But some people will do that to infatuate over how high they can kick. This sort of thing, okay? There is a time and place for the one where we do the, the uh, pendulum style kick, where I come up, slide in, and take it through. It's very powerful. It's a snap kick. I think it's the best snap kick there is. Come in. Move off the target like that. And it, it's very deceptive. But when you want to keep your body upright so that you can return to the ball position, you keep your head up. That kind of movement uh, is very important to get the head tending to the front. Now, when we work back kick, okay, I want to come one, two. We, this is how we used to teach it. Throw the jab, tap the hand, pivot, and point at the target. My kicking leg is where my weight is. We always we used to say to the guys, lift the other foot off. Now, as I kick with my right leg, my right shoulder and hand, come back, okay? One, two. I don't ever take my eyes off my opponent twice like I just did. Kick and then back. I only ever take them off my opponent once. So look, eyes are on, eyes are on, eyes are off. They're on again, and I don't take them off again. 
this hand snaps back as the kick comes. If I place it, then I get out of range. Okay? So by telling myself one, I counterbalance with the shoulder and hand. I keep my eyes on him and I don't take them off him again. Two, put my foot down, step off with the other foot, and rotate out. And you can see how far away you are. Okay? If I kick with my right leg, I can either switch or just be deceptive with your footwork. There. Okay, rotate, get my left shoulder in. My left leg, kicking leg, is where the weight is. And then I kick, counterbalance, step off, and half shuffle out. Okay? So, for the sake of the kick, I want to make sure that I counterbalance the power of the kick with my upper body. Okay, so that's very important in terms of working the kick from the fighting stance. So we used to do it like this. I kick, and Mitch would counter kick straight away. Yes, and boom. And I'd, if he, if he block, if he kick, I'd block, or I'd work on getting out of range. Then I kick, he'd block, and then come straight back. So to teach me to develop the habit of uh, returning straight away to default position, okay, like that. What do you think about using the heel instead of the ball of the foot for Mayagetti? It's fantastic. The problem is you don't get the same extension, and by hyperflexing the ankle, Paul, you tend to tense up the leg a little bit too much. The thing about the ball of the foot is it almost flips out so the leg is relaxed, which means more speed. But definitely, I used to kick with the toes. I used to kick front kicks with the tip of my toes. The, the, using the toes is actually like stabbing someone. It's very, very effective. Ball of the foot, but 100%. Kicking with the heel, especially up under the chin, is, is excellent. You just don't get the same distance. So if you're training your kicks to kick with the ball of the foot and then you change to the heel, it's actually that much different. So you've got to actually tra train yourself to optimize it with a different length, which can be a bit tricky. 100%, if you walk into a dojo and the instructor does something which you intuitively know is not good, get out of there as quick as you can. Yeah. yeah, I think it's one of those things that probably people underestimate how important it is. Some shocking teachers out there, I think. Yep. I think we will, Mac, big toe lifts. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so just stay there, Mitch. Yes. So I'm going to actually come back. I'll lean on you. So we have this. We have this idea of the big toe coming up. The reason we do that is because that will turn the foot laterally so that the the ball of the foot, I mean the side, the, the soccer toe is out like that. So when I was a kid, we learned to lift the big toe up and the little toes down. Later on, it becomes less important as you get used to that. Okay, uh, and in fact, I believe in some styles, if you put, do the big toe up and little toes down, they say it's wrong. But if your kick knocks them out, it's right. <laughs> okay, so you go from this to that, and if you can still do it and still get the heel out, well, then it's 100% applicable. But that's a good point. I don't think that it, I think the way it changes your structure is a beneficial way, Mac. I think that affects the structure. Um, from my personal experience, I've tried to work out where it's it's not good, and I can't work out where it's not good. It, because if you're kicking with the side of the heel correctly, it makes absolutely no difference where the big toe is. But if you can do it without twisting the toe up, well, then I guess there's a slight advantage in that, but not in terms of uh, the structure of the the, uh, the side of the foot. Anyway, Harry. Most people are afraid to bend over while doing a kick to gain height and power. Yeah, they should be too. I don't know. Gaining height by leaning away makes a lot of sense. But gaining power by leaning away doesn't. No. no. Power is a function of body weight into the technique. Okay. Or power from a in somatic that, viewpoint. In that, yeah. in that respect, uh, power... It's like you were saying with a high kick and you want to headbutt the target. Yes. You want your weight going in that direction, not away. Yep. There are certain techniques like a fast left jab. Even a left jab, if it's done incorrectly with the same speed, won't be as powerful if the body weight isn't behind it. Uh, so with kicks, the number one important point is to make sure the body weight is behind the kick so you get that power. 
Uh, but if you can lean away to get, there are certain things like that one that I do where I lean my head away like a pendulum. That's that's not a power kick, it's a speed kick. So you're doing that to, you're taking advantage of kinetic energy, which is half mass by velocity, velocity squared. So the faster the kick, you you know, you double the body weight, you double the power, you double the speed, you quadruple the power because it's squared. So, you know, I think that's very important as well to recognize that sometimes speed kills. <laughs> Good. Uh, Margo, do you think it's important to look peripherally at the target? Ah, uh, yes, indeed, I do. Um, I think it's always good for a couple of reasons, Marco. One is it gives you good structure in what you're doing. Two is it'll help maintain flexibility in your neck. I mean, that's an underestimated area that you have to think of. But as you get older, your neck ossifies and you get you, your neck starts to like even that is hard when you're as a kid you can look right over your shoulder so by continually looking over your shoulder you're working the neck it's the same as when when we roll we do a stretch this stretch here i'll do it from this position you bring your knees up roll them to one side take this shoulder flat on the floor and take the arm out there now you can lie here like this and get a nice stretch is that on the, yep but if I tell myself that my gaze should be on the thumb, then you're getting a stretch in the neck as well. You can lie here, and for all intents and purposes, you're still getting the same stretch, but you're not stretching your neck. So by doing that, you'll find that if your neck is half tight, you'll feel it. So you add that on. Well, it's the same thing in all your kicks. If you throw a kick, and I just get used to looking to the front, your body weight will go where your head is going. Okay, so by turning in, your body weight goes into the kick. If I look here, my body weight goes there. I can feel it even as a... But if I look there, my body weight goes into the kick itself. So that's a good point. You should look in the direction of the kick, even if it's peripherally. Toby, hey, man. Good to see you, man. Mark Sang. Toby Sang. Mark's, Toby's dad, Mark, is my first black belt. Good on you. Do you see much value in hook kicks for fighting? 100%. Look, it depends on the fighting, Toby, and also it depends on the opponent, and it depends on the opponent's read. If your opponent is a fighter who can read things very well, well, then you can also use that to your advantage, okay? But a hook kick, and please forgive me, I'm not, I don't have my flexibility, so I'm, I'm, I have trouble, but a hook kick is this. There. See where... Mitch's hand is over here. So it's like if I could ask him to bring it down a little bit, and there's my target here. Okay? So imagine 20, 30 years ago where his Mitch's hands would have been here. Well, they're not anymore. <laughs> I can tell you now. So they're right here. So a hook kick essentially is a side kick gone wrong. So if I want to, if I do a side kick there, I step up, and there's my side kick. There's my side kick. A hook kick is a side kick that's gone wonky. So now I aim here with my side kick, and instead of bringing it back like that, I actually hook it back. So now I'm aiming there for the side kick, and then I bring it back. Instead of bringing it back straight, I bring it back through the target. So it's very deceptive because it kind of goes off target, and then it comes in at an angle. So, yes, Toby, I think there's a lot of value in it. Um, Daniel asked how I break a Yoshiro Moshi down. I would break the Yoshiro Moshi down simply to the back kick, one, and then it would be the side kick off target. So it would be just like we just did. Don't exaggerate. Well, this morning we did those ones. So yeah. we'll do these ones now. Remember, the hook kick straight on is on coming in. Let me go this way so you can see a little better what I'm doing with my hands and everything. So I'm aiming off the target, not straight at Mitch, off the target with the side kick. And then I hook it in like that to get the target with my heel now. And you get a tendon reflex in the knee as well. So that's the faster it goes out, the faster the hook will come back. Ushiro Gedi, Ushiro Moshi Gedi, Daniel. Exactly the same. But now, instead of doing it from this static side position, I'm doing it from a side mobile position, exactly the same way. And I aim here, but I hook it through there. 
I'll just take that one out of the way so that'll kind of whack your little finger. So even though the target is here, I'm actually aiming for here like that. Okay, so I come in, one, and bring it through the target like that. Of course, thanks. Guys who are really flexible and have the benefit of youthful uh, agility in their joints can do amazing things. I would actually even look to, uh, for example, um, Daz or Darren Stringer in UK and some of the kicks he does. Have a look on YouTube, see if you can find Darren Stringer's stuff. Uh, the KRT boys, uh, he and Wes do fantastic stuff and they've been at it for as long as I can remember during uh, lockdown through COVID for the last couple of years and they're still at it and they do fantastic sessions. And Darren Stringer would have to be one of the uh, most flexible, dynamic, successful kickers I've ever seen. If you want to gauge the importance of where you look, make a strong sunshine posture while rolling your eyes to <laughs> have someone push you. That's a really good point. While your eyes are rolling up, try to stay grounded. It's true. Where the head goes, the body follows. Where the head goes, the intent leads. Where the intent leads, the body follows. So if you want to be grounded, you're definitely not going to get it by rolling your eyes around up there. Well, it's the same with any kick. You need to uh, do what Mike says and make sure that you don't disconnect your eye movement from your body movement. The eyes are like a couple of little brains, and what they're doing will completely throw you off, won't it? It will. And yeah. actually, I heard a neuroscientist talk recently, and he was saying that the eyes are actually part of your brain that have been squished forward, literally. So that's there the way the neurosurgeons look at it, apparently. There you go. That's so interesting. Yeah. So that's a good point that Mike makes, is that everything is connected. Nothing is uh, arbitrary. So if you want to get power on a kick, one of the very first things that you can do to get power on a kick is simply learn to take your head to the kick. I don't want to throw the kick and take my head away because even if you hit the target, you have no penetration in the kick. I need to work on that idea of my body weight going forward. Okay, that's very, very important. Of course, Toby Gettys, jumping kicks and things like that are a different uh, level again. Of course, Kenneth, good to see you. Okie doke. So I think, oh, here we go. Hamstring strength for a hook kick, quad strength from Washi Getty and balance. Well, I think hamstring quads, one of the big things we make a mistake of in the world is we get an imbalance in the, the front end. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's a good point, but I would probably describe it as it's hamstring flexion that does the hook kick and quad extension. Ex yeah, extend or flexion, extending the knee, uh, which gets the power in the front. That's the going. terminal part of the kick, the end of the kick, though. Yes. Earlier, it's the hip. You know, yes. The hip's got to lift up and the glutes have got to extend for the other one. So, anyway. Yeah, that, that's an area we don't really look at. Is It's like uh, a 100 metre sprinter, like Mitch was saying last time that in actual fact, the static explosive power off the blocks is something people don't think about. It's just like an arbitrary part of the sprint and we just want to see them flying down the track. But in actual fact, that has a lot to the do with it. enormous amount of training yes. in that one part of the race. That yeah. one explosive thing. Well, the kick is the same. You have the initial setup. You have the footwork. You have the explosiveness of the, of the tendon reflex. And then you have the snap fast, super explosive uh, elevation of the knee in such a way that allows the kick to come through the target. So there are so many uh, facets of the kick, the setup, that the, the uh, explosive movement from the default position. And that's why some guys never stop moving because you overcome that momentum immediately. Okay. And then the elevation, the elevation, the speed. I, we had a young fella named Yusuke Fuji. Remember Yusuke? Yusuke. Yusuke went on and won the uh, Kyokushin Khan Worlds. I, I think he won the Worlds. If he didn't, he won the All Japan at least a couple of times. But Yusuke trained with me from when he was 15 years old for three years, and we worked on making sure he got that explosiveness in his kick. He had a lot already, but we just worked his ability to find that explosiveness uh, and body weight in his kick. He was a fantastic kicker, and he really knew how to get the body weight into his kick. Uh, so that was excellent. So anyway, guys, look, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, alignment. Your head, where the head goes, the body follows. Where the eyes lead, the intent goes, the kick goes. 
okay? Remember, you want to work on uh, that explosiveness, the tendon reflex, all those sort of things come into play. Craig mentioned that too. I've heard that too. L looking initiates a, ho a whole body flexure looking extensive, initiates yeah, response. Well, there you go. Yes, that's a very good point, Craig. Um, that's true. So, you know, where the eyes go, the body follows. Uh, where the head goes, the body follows. You can use that to your advantage too. In that, that's why we call what we call dominant head position in a wrestling situation. If I get in here on Mitch, I have dominance because my head is heading towards his spine. His head is heading over there. So if he tried to generate power into me, it'd be very hard for him to do it until he regained dominant head position there. And now he has the dominance. Okay, so that's a fundamental, very easily understood example of why the head leads the body. Of course. So anyway, good to see you guys. I hope you enjoyed it, Mitch, yes, as you. always. Thank you. Really appreciate you coming in and helping. Uh, that was a lot of fun, and it's good to see, especially good to see Toby Sang and Ross Cameron's names there. Yes, Toby, good on you, buddy. And Toby's doing great uh, in the BJJ world at the moment too, which is very exciting. Is Toby the one that you told me about? So that's, um... Yeah, Toby's like – Toby's – if if you had a chance to create an avatar for a game, Toby would be your avatar. He's like – Six, how tall are you, Toby? He's about 6'3", and he's just like, you know, he's got everything going for him. He's uh, much better looking than his dad. But don't tell him I said that, Toby, because your dad's a good guy. But anyway, uh, yes, he's the one. Great, great athletic potential, and he knows how to use it, and he's got a brain. So good on you. Uh, everybody, thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you next week. Us.